Today we read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to, to him the other also. <clears throat> and if anyone would sue you and take your cloak, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to him who begs from you and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. You, should, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you salute only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Jesus doesn't make a lot of sense all the time. I don't think I'm on. Hold on one second. Can you hear me now? Man, I feel like a Verizon commercial every time I say that, right? But Jesus doesn't always make sense, does he? You read the words of Christ and you go, well, that was an interesting day with the disciples. We, though, only get part of the story. <clears throat> because we read this today with our today interpretation and our today understanding. We think, oh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But if one person strikes you with the right fist, you turn around and punch them with the left, right? I mean, I don't know about y'all, but that's what I learned in boxing. <laughs> and if someone gives, takes your coat from you, give them your cloak also. How many of us have more than one coat in our closet? How many of us have more than one coat or sweater on right now? <laughs> Although I don't know why. It's going to be 75 something degrees outside. It's it's a little bit more. And if you walk, if they force you to walk one mile, why not walk two? I don't know, y'all, walking a mile, shoot, I don't think I can do it. But we read that with today's understanding and think, oh, let's go. Let's be more like Jesus. Let's go that extra mile, right? That's an idiom we all know. Give a person the shirt off our back. That's an idiom we know. And this, this is the scripture from which those things come. But the thing is, is we can't read scripture with just our interpretation of today's understanding. You see, Christ didn't mean that. Because Christ grew up in the time of the Roman Empire. And in that time, your right hand was the hand of cleanliness. Your left hand, though, was not. That's the reason there's a whole left-handed day. For anyone who is left-handed, you are special and wonderful. But back in the time of the ancients, you who were left-handed would be forced to only use your right hand. I remember my grandparents at some point. Now, my grandparents have been deceased for some time, so forgive me if this is not 
your experience. <coughs> but my grandparents would talk about the fact that the people in their classes who were left-handed would actually be forced to use their right hand. Does anyone remember that time? I don't know. This is where that comes from. So Jesus, instead of saying, if turning one cheek, so if you turn someone's strike on the right cheek, you can use your right fist to strike somebody else on the right cheek. But if they turn their cheek for you to hit them on the left, they would have to use their left hand, and that was considered unclean. So guess what? They couldn't. And if someone would take their coat and then you would give them their cloak also, you'd be naked. Because while we wear quite a few layers today, the people of ancient of the ancient times in the time and era and the space of which we are talking about where Jesus lived, it's a very different climate. And they didn't wear quite as much. So someone took their coat and then they took their cloak. Nakedness is also a sin. To see another person naked would make you unclean. And then the other thing, the mile. Oh, oh, that one. You see, the Roman army could force someone to carry their pack for one mile and one mile only. If any of you have ever traveled to Europe, there are mile markers. Shoot, go on the highway. I love those things. They let me know how far we are from one place to another if you pay attention to those things. On most major interstates, there's mile markers, right? So the Roman soldier could make someone carry their gear for one mile and one mile only. And then Jesus said, well, why not carry it too? Because you who were carrying the pack would not be in trouble, but the soldier who, who forced you to carry the pack would be then in trouble. We cannot always read scripture with today's understanding because then we lose the true meaning. Really, Jesus is saying, <laughs> be kind, but don't let someone take advantage of your self and what you do. Hitting people's not nice, is it? We teach that to them. I hope we're teaching that to them. <laughs> and so rather than saying, oh, you know, go ahead and let them hit both sides, it's really saying don't let them hit you at all. Being a bully, we read about that today. Oh, man, the term bullying, isn't that the, the uh, hot button topic? Almost to the point at which you go, kids can't be kids. There is a level and a balance there, right? But if a bully takes your coat and you give them your shirt as well, it reads very differently today than it would read then. And going one mile, or going the extra mile, oh, that one burns under my skin. You need to go the extra mile. And they're referring to this, and I go, well, that's not what Jesus meant. But you see, Jesus isn't speaking to us all the time today. Jesus' words are prophetic. They speak to us through time. They transcend time. The meaning of them transcends time. The circumstances that he is speaking of do not necessarily transcend time. And we see that throughout the Gospels. I'm not a farmer. Some of you are. Or were. Some of you know what a garden looks like. Not here. And he talks a lot about those. Some of us are fishermen. Some of us know how to fish. I'm really good if I can even get the worm on a hook. I don't go 
know what it is to go and put a net out and pull fish up. Like, that's weird to me. That's not my experience. That's not my job. And yet all of these stories, all of these things that he says are ways of relating to the people of whom he is speaking to. And that transcends time, right? We all know the best speakers are the ones that relate to us in our time. Who take the words of Christ and say, well, here is the circumstance today, and this is how those two things come and line up beside one another. But I think the next words he says have the most meaning. And I think that this is the hardest thing. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's hard. Because he goes from talking about not being a doormat, I mean, that's the easiest way of understanding, understanding the above part of the passage, to then talking about forgiveness. We all know how many times you're supposed to forgive, right? How many times are we supposed to forgive people? 70 times 7, 77 times, depending on your translation. And that's hard enough. But he says it again here, and in the way he says it, it's interesting. Because he talks about, it's easy to love people who love you. Right? Who doesn't want to be loved? I think that's the basic need of humanity, is to be loved, to be in a relationship with one another, and to feel loved and respected. Because love and respect go hand in hand. But he says, even the tax collectors, and we all know tax collectors, I don't know anyone who likes the IRS today either. I mean, I don't, that one's transition time. Unless you work for them. It's easy to love those who love us. It's easy to be with people who understand us. It's easy to put ourselves in an isolated bubble and feel good about ourselves and our opinions and our understanding. But Jesus says for us to do differently. He says us to react differently. And that's the hardest part of, of, of Matthew 5. Is it is probably one of the most difficult chapters in Scripture to, to pull apart and to see and to understand because it covers so much. We go from Beatitudes to the salt to the light to the understanding of the law. To here. This is the end of the chapter for those of you who don't know. Or if you want, you can turn to page 5 in your Bibles in front of you in the pew and follow along. But understanding Jesus is difficult. Right? Understanding what he means and how he means it is part of the struggle of how we live our faith out today. It's a lot harder to say, oh, well, that's not speaking to me. We like to do that, though, don't we? We like to say, mm -hmm, well, I don't quite get it, so I'm just going to put it aside, I'll study it later, or, or deal with it later. We all have circumstances and things in life that we do that with. How many of us have a back burner so full <laughs> that I have a stove probably the size of my garage? And I've got a two-car garage. Right? 
we put things off because we're not necessarily wanting to accept or read into or, or get them. They don't quite make sense. They don't fit into our, our known understanding. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He does it throughout the scriptures. Because Jesus is constantly up in battle against the Pharisees. Right? We all know those Pharisees, those bad, bad Pharisees. I mean, even in the song, I don't want to be a sheep, it's I don't want to be a Pharisee, because they're not fair, you see. I think in some ways they get a slightly bad rap. Because being a Pharisee is being us. Us who live out our faith understanding in the way we've always done it, because that's the way it's always been done. I mean, how many of us feel that way? It's always been done that way, so why change it? Why do it differently? Why even understand it? Why even question it? You know, I was at that retreat this weekend. I call it a, I mean, a retreat, a conference, whatever it is. And I was thinking about the fact that Jesus comes in to the Jewish community like a big deal, right? I mean, we know he came in with a spotlight, rock band, music concert. Here I am. Praise the Lord. Here's Jesus. Amen. <coughs> He's interpreting and understanding the scripture because the words you have heard that it was said, Jesus knew those scriptures like the back of his hand. He knew them. And so he's just quoting what we know comes from the Old Testament. The Old Testament that the Pharisees of the time <coughs> lived out. Because the Pharisees were rabbis. They were the elite of the elite, the good Christians, the people you wanted to emulate because they got, well, not good Christians, sorry, good Jews. They're the people you wanted to emulate because somehow, some way, they got it. And then they had this young upstart, because we all know that 33 is not that old, who comes in and says, well, you heard it this way. But let me tell you a new way of understanding it. I don't know how many people have ever gone to a Christian rock concert sort of conference thing in that regard. But I liken it to those things because I feel like we as the church, in some ways, Fulfill the role of the Pharisees. We're trying to do the best that we can with what we know and how we understand and what we see and what we do, and we do it well. And then we hear across town is this wonderful big thing going on and it gets tons of people there. How do we do it that way? I don't think either is wrong, but it's a question that we have to answer in some way, shape, or form as we understand Jesus. Because it's not all about the big movements and the big moments. This Sermon on the Mount, I can't tell you the number of ministers that have written books. Big, thick, long, boring books on it. And what they come away with it, and how they come away from it, varies based on their understanding and their experience. The same way what we understand 
Jesus to be comes from how we have experienced the gospel, who we've known Jesus to be, how we've read through our scriptures, what we know to be true through our church life, through our faith life, through our family life. All of these things come into play. And that's what Jesus answers here. In some small way. He talks about how we respond and he talks about forgiveness. And he talks about perfection. That's that last line. I don't like that last line. Who hates perfection? I don't know. I mean, some people do. I was the perfect sister, so I guess I was the good one. I was the middle child, man, y'all. It was good. I could do no wrong, according to my sisters. And I felt that they did everything wrong, so I had to be perfect. You can analyze families all you want, but we all know those people, right? <laughs> We either had a friend or a sibling or a cousin. Who had those cousins who your family always said, why can't you do it like them? They've got it all together. Jesus' command here is, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. not be like the tax collectors or even the Gentiles to do the same things over and over again. He is saying take it one step further. Astound them not just by loving them, loving those who are easy to love, but astound them by loving those who are not easy to love. I don't know how many of you have ever watched the, the, the movie Hallmark. Who doesn't love Hallmark movies? Hallmark movie channel. If you don't, sorry, I do. Um, and you can add, you might add this to your bucket list. You might not. It depends on what you feel about sci-fi. Um, but Hallmark has a series called The Good Witch. And the very first movie, there's a little boy and he's being bullied on his way to school. And they don't quite know why or anything along those lines, but finally, this one, the, the, the good witch person says, follow them and find out what's going on. So he follows them and he finds out that the boy who was bullying him was being bullied by his father. So it's a learned behavior. And it ends up, of course, in the, in the way that all Hallmark movies end up all honky-dory tied in a bow of love. That he befriends the boy and they have pizza together and play football and life is good. It's not that easy, is it? But this is what Christ says about forgiveness. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. We don't pray for forgiveness for others to be made new in Christ. We pray for forgiveness so that we may be made new in Christ. Because forgiveness is a hard and difficult thing, particularly when someone is doing it over and over and over again. When you're being persecuted over and over and over again. When someone's striking you on both cheeks, or making you walk those miles, or stealing your cloak. Christ is saying, forgive them, love them, Pray for them, because it's easy to love those who love you, 
It is harder to love those who hate you, or who are different from you, or who disagree with you. But the reason we forgive them is not for them. It's for us. So that we can be better followers of Christ. So that we can clear our heart from the anger, the frustration, the angst that a lack of true forgiveness causes. But Christ isn't saying forgive them and not let them do and let them continue on in bad behavior. I mean, the first part of this is saying resist. Don't let them continue cause them to think and evaluate it differently. But forgive them. Love them. Pray for them. Forgive them. Love them. Pray for them. Perhaps that's the way we need to deal with all people in this life. I know you can close your eyes and think of that person, can't you? The one who makes you angry, or who walks in a room and you just kind of go, okay, how do I deal with them today? Some of us are fortunate. Those people are in our past. We've moved away, or they're no longer present. Or some of us are unfortunate because we're not able to reconcile. Because we like happy endings, don't we? We want the prince to meet the princess and ride off into the sunset. That's why I love Hallmark movies. Shoot, they tie up in the last five minutes. You don't need to watch the beginning, they're all the same. But fast forward your DVR up to probably <laughs> minute one hour and 53, there's one for a commercial break. You might have to scroll a little before it to get a little bit of the gist. But it ties up neatly in a bow. You know, the Hallmark movie channel is the most watched and DVR movie channel between the months of uh, the, shoot, November to February. For that reason, a life we know is not filled with all happy endings unless we ourselves are happy. And happiness comes internally. It's not an external point of view. It is not something anyone else can give you. It is something you yourself have to seize. And Christ offers us the way of seizing that happiness, that peace, the contentment of love. And so I say to you, love, 